In this tape, the first of two on the anatomy of the head and neck, we'll look first at the structures involved in support and movement of the head, then at the facial skeleton and base of the skull, then at the structures involved in breathing, eating, swallowing, and speaking. In the second tape, we'll look at the blood vessels of the head and neck, then at the brain, the cranial nerves, the ear, and the eye. As in other parts of the body, understanding the bones provides the foundation for everything else we need to learn. The skull is such a complicated piece of bony anatomy that we won't try to understand all of it at once. Instead, we'll build up our picture of it a little at a time in the course of this tape. In each section, we'll add the parts of the skull that are new to the parts that we've seen already. In that way, we'll end up with a complete picture. In this first section, we'll look at the way the head is attached to the body and how it moves. We'll start by looking at the bones that are involved, then we'll look at the joints and ligaments that connect them. After that, we'll look at the muscles that maintain the position of the head and cause it to move. The bones that are involved in support and movement of the head are the thoracic and cervical vertebrae, the upper ribs, the clavicles, and this part of the underside of the skull that's called the occiput. The skull consists of the cranium and the facial skeleton. The cranium is the bony container for the brain and the foundation for the facial skeleton. The cranium is made up of a number of originally separate bones. These lines of fusion, known as sutures, show where the bones are joined. The principal bones that form the cranium are the occipital bone behind and below, the parietal bone and temporal bone on each side, the sphenoid bone and the frontal bone. The two bones of the cranium that we're concerned with at present are the occipital bone and the lower part of the adjoining temporal bone. To see the full extent of the occipital bone, we'll take the mandible out of the picture. The occipital bone extends all the way from here at the back to here underneath. The most striking feature of the occipital bone is this large opening, the foramen magnum, through which the spinal cord and its accompanying structures pass. The part of the occipital bone in front of the foramen magnum is called the basilar part, often referred to as the base of the occiput. The two temporal bones converge on it from each side. We'll look at them in a minute. Let's look at the occipital bone on the inside in a skull that's been divided in the midline. Here's the foramen magnum. Here's the basilar part of the occipital bone. It slopes forwards and upwards, more steeply on the inside than on the underside, since it's triangular in sagittal section. Let's look at some more details in a skull that hasn't been colored. On each side of the anterior half of the foramen magnum are the two occipital condyles. The occipital condyles are the joint surfaces which articulate with the atlas vertebra to form the atlanto-occipital joints. We'll look at these joints in a minute. The outline of the front and the top of the cranium is well known to us from our everyday observation of surface anatomy. It's perhaps surprising to see how far round the back of the cranium curves and what an extensive overhang there is behind. The overhang is formed by the part of the occipital bone that's behind the foramen magnum, the squamous part. The overhang is obscured by the neck muscles that are attached to this broad area on the occipital bone. 
the bone bears the marks of their attachment. This lump in the middle is the external occipital protuberance. This faint ridge, leading out toward the mastoid process, is the superior nuchal line. Below it is the inferior nuchal line. We'll meet the structures that are attached here later in this section. Now that we've looked at the occipital bone, let's take a look at the temporal bone. It's quite a complicated bone. To see its full extent, we'll again remove the mandible. The temporal bone goes from here on the outside to here underneath. This is the petrous part of the temporal bone. This is the squamous part. A prominent feature of the temporal bone is this large projection, the mastoid process. As we'll see, it's the origin of some of the muscles that move the head, including the sternocleidomastoid. It's easy to feel the mastoid process here, behind and below the ear. While we're getting introduced to the temporal bone, we'll take a first look at some of its other important features, which we'll appreciate in later sections of these two tapes. We'll also meet some of the small openings through which important blood vessels, nerves, and other structures enter and leave the cranium. There are many of these openings. Here, we'll just look at the openings on the outside of the temporal and occipital bones. This is the zygomatic arch, formed largely by the temporal bone and partly by the adjoining zygomatic bone. Here on the underside of the root of the zygomatic arch, this complex curved surface articulates with the condyle of the mandible to form the temporomandibular joint. This is the external auditory meatus leading to the middle ear. This long, sharp projection is the styloid process. Just at the base of the styloid is the little stylomastoid foramen for the facial nerve. Medial to the styloid process are two major openings for blood vessels. The carotid canal passing forwards for the internal carotid artery and the jugular foramen passing backwards for the internal jugular vein. Just above the occipital condyle is the hypoglossal canal for the hypoglossal nerve. 